Good morning. I'm Linda Kincaid with the Coalition for Elder and Disability Rights. Very brief background. I worked for 25 years doing chemical safety consulting. I have a Master of Public Health from UC Berkeley. And now I am very much an advocate for the rights of the elderly and people with dis disabilities. If you are considering retiring here and you're an elderly, wealthy person, think twice. I spoke to my mom on Thursday and she was fine. I called her on Friday and there was nobody picking up. Somebody took my parents. It's not supposed to happen in America. I was fighting with Buck and he was fighting me. They grabbed me and they kept telling me to love it there. I asked them where I was. You're on the sixth floor in the psych ward. No! You can't fuck! People go in. Corpses come out. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and appoint your guardian today. A guardian is appointed through the courts to have authority over someone's life. You turn over immediately your bank account, checking account, savings account. They're using senior citizens as the key to the money. We have nothing left. There are relationships between the doctors, the lawyers, the private guardian industry, and the court. I am was victimized based on an incorrect diagnosis by an unqualified person. They were trying to convince us nothing to see here. And that raises red flags for any investigative journalist. We've got to keep the light shining on the people that are being taken. I cannot do this. I cannot let these people get away with everything. It needs a mess or an investigation. That was a 90 second trailer from the, the documentary film, The Guardians. There's a flyer going around. There will be a screening at UCLA on Friday, October 25th, uh, along with a panel discussion. And it'd be great if folks want to come see the rest of the film. I really appreciated the discussion earlier about health equity. Health equity presumes that a person has the ability to take advantage of, of opportunities that are available to them. And there's a, a category of individuals that's not often discussed, people under guardianship, as it was called in Nevada in the film, or here in California, it's called conservatorship, a category of people who do not have the civil rights and do not have the ability to take advantage of those opportunities. Some people call conservatorship civil death. Essentially, all of a person's civil rights are taken away. The few civil rights that legally are retained are often violated by the conservator, by the courts, by facilities, by law enforcement. Essentially, the person becomes a non-entity as, as a human being, as an adult, as we all understand our rights as we have them in this country. There have been efforts to reform the, the laws about conservatorship, uh, 2005, LA Times did a series of exposés on a number of professional fiduciaries who were acting as conservators in California. One of them was Prumi LeBeau, did extensive writing about uh, Ms. LeBeau. And then in 2006, there was the Omnibus Conservatorship and Guardianship Reform Act of 2006. That act has not yet been funded or implemented. And Prumi LeBeau of LA Times infamy is still out there doing the same things that she was doing 15, 20, 30 years ago. So just out of curiosity, we started digging into the public records. And we have some billings that were taken out of public records. What I'm going to show you is all in the public record, court documents, and approved by the court. This is from none other than Frumi LeBeau. Right there, where I was pointing that 24, that represents 24 hours a day. Ms. LeBeau, on a number of days, is billing over 24 hours in a day. How many hours can any of you work if you are highly motivated and highly caffeinated? Can any of you make it up to 30, 40 hours in a day? Let's look at Sally Cicero. This is, Orange, this is LA County, and now let's look at Sally Cicero in Orange County. Let me find 24 on here. There's 24. That line where I was pointing was 24 hours a day. We got up almost to 60 hours a day for Sally Cicerone. 
So if we're talking about health equity, and if your estate is being plundered to pay fees to attorneys and conservators, I think that opens up an entirely new realm of discussion. And now I'm gonna to have to duck out and go next door to another presentation. My associates are going to take over for me. Um, we would like to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Vivian Doe. Um, I'm a current, current second year undergraduate student at UCLA and I got involved with um, all of this research when I took a class on autism. And I kind of learned the dark side of all of this um, about autism as well as elements of youth. Um, and I've gotten into all this research ever since. Hi, my name is Julie Hermes, and I'm a Southern California disability rights and elder rights advocate. And my involvement began when um, it's a personal history. My husband got hit by a car on an icicle, and he has traumatic brain injury with Alzheimer's. And uh, we became victims of the system. And we are now in the Orange County court systems. And uh, my efforts are to avoid him going into uh, a conservatorship. But there's still a, a whole other set of problems that uh, I have been fortunate enough to avoid that at this point. And then so today, um, to kind of discuss this idea of elder abuse and what we can do um, going forward, we have two case studies um, to present today that again, like, um, Linda Kincaid was telling us earlier, these are all court approved records, um, depositions as well. Um, so our first story is about the conservatorship of Ms. Carol Hahn. Um, here we can have a little brief history of Carol Hahn. Um, the, it started out with kidnapping, right? As we saw in the trailer, there was a lot of times when these people just entered the home and said, you're coming with us. Um, as you hear, see here, Carol Hahn's tax preparers broke into Carol Hahn's home um, and then began to hide her in a senior apartment. Um, then Carol Hahn's step-granddaughter then seized Carol Hahn's uh, $1 million estate um, and then proceeded to hide her in an assisted living facility. Um, and that's a very key fact, um, assisted living facility rather than a skilled nursing facility um, where she would have gotten a lot more of the proper care that she would have needed. Um, the court then appointed the step-granddaughter as the conservator um, and the facility began to isolate her um, over the course of 15 months. Um, you'll see in the later slides, she slept on a mattress on the floor. Um, and there's over 29 documented falls, and uh, we'll talk about later um, as well, evidence of sexual abuse by a male caregiver. Um, so we see here in this court record uh, about her kidnapping. Um, and in the deposition uh, with the step granddaughter, they talked about um, you basically went six and a half years without seeing Carol Hahn. Um, she said, correct, I have not seen her for over six and a half years. Um, and then what was the reason she did not come? My grandmother asked me not to come. So this kind of paints this whole picture of um, someone who has not been a part of Carol Hahn's life inserting themselves and then um, doing this kidnapping. Um, and then continuation of this deposition, um, well, what is the name of the assisted care uh, facility? Um, she said she did not want to go to the Wildwood facility. Yes, the answer was yes, she did not want to move. She did not want to move, correct. Um, but you moved her anyway. Again, and she said we did. Um, as we can see here, um, they took away uh, Carol Hahn's rights. They moved her without her wanting to. Someone who has not been a part of her life uh, inserted herself into her life. Um, and then here we have um, the police records about this kidnapping. Um, San Bernardino County Sheriff um, talks about how unknown subjects kicked down the door, pushed down the door to get into there. And here we have the picture of the deadbolt splintered, um, the wood of the door jam um, showing uh, signs of a break in of uh, Carol Hahn's home. Um, and what did the law enforcement say? They said, we can't do anything. It's a civil matter. It's not a criminal matter. Um, Nothing out of the ordinary, don't worry about it. They let it all go on. Um, and then we talk about a little bit about her imprisonment and isolation while she lived in the assisted care facility. Um, instructed staff denied all visitor rights as well as phone calls um, from loved ones for 15 months. Just think about that. How many of you have gone 15 months without talking to someone that you care about? 
No one, right? I called my mom last night. Um, so these people, uh, Carol Hahn was isolated for 15 months without any uh, talking. And then after 16 hearings, they issued a temporary restraining order against isolation elder abuse. Um, and the family's legal cost was over seven, over 70,000. Um, and still, they still restricted uh, her visitation rights and she was never allowed private visitation. Imagine never being able to have a private visitation with their mother, um, with their daughter, anything like that. And so here we again have um, the Sheriff Department's um, records of this isolation and imprisonment. Um, they said that corporate attorneys was not allowed and did not allow anyone to visit um, that was not specifically authorized by the step-granddaughter. And again, we talked about it earlier, the step-granddaughter was not in the picture for six and a half years. Um, and this was all under the pretense that uh, Carol Hahn's doctor advised the daughter um, for not any, no visitors to be allowed. Again, um, they continue to talk about how um, the daughter of Carol Hahn would not be allowed back into the facility, um, and if she was to come back, they would seek charges of trespassing. Um, and this is a continuation of um, the records about the facility tenant service notes about the executive director of the facility um, stating that um, they would not be allowed to see um, Carol Hahn. Um, again, continuing in the tenant service notes, um, they don't allow anyone in the building, no visitors at all. And then a continuation of this, uh, the court appointed attorney also talks about um, they do not welcome her to visit her mother in the facility. Um, and this, uh, they show this complaint investigation continuing, again, not allowing anyone to talk and continuing to allow her to live in isolation. Um, but a big part of this is um, the licensee would submit, uh, the only plan of correction for this was they just had to submit a letter essentially, submitting that, uh, a statement that they would not do this again. Um, I promise I won't ever isolate another uh, patient again. Um, but a key point right here in red is there is no financial penalty assessed. Imagine that, you kept someone in isolation for 15 months um, to cause them all of this abuse, but there was no penalty assessed. You just had to write an apology letter and said, sorry, I won't do it again. Um, and continuing, um, law enforcement always said that no crime was committed because under this conservatorship, uh, it's now considered a legal, uh, a civil matter rather than a criminal matter. So Carol Hahn was never um, taken out of the facility. Um, as you can see here, the San Bernardino County District Attorney said that there's nothing out of the ordinary and told the daughter to stop calling them, that this is normal, um, and that it can lead to uh, false imprisonment on the daughter's behalf. Um, and as we talked about earlier, this is her living situation right here. She lived on a mattress on the floor um, on a brown carpet and um, she continued to fall. As we talked about earlier, she had 29 falls. Um, Again, right here in the complaint investigation report, it said mattress on the floor, um, and this claim was substantiated. And again, no no financial penalty was assessed. Um, they just said, write a submit a statement that you won't do this again, apologizing, um, and so on. Um, and when the law enforcement was contacted about the poor living faci uh, facilities, there was no response. and. Um, it was uh, showing here that it willfully, a person who willfully causes or permits uh, el any elder or dependent adult to suffer or inflicts them unjustifiable physical pain or mental suffering is guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, right here we see this in the penal co code, yet the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department did nothing. There was no response to any of this. And as you can see here um, in Carol Hahn's picture, we see bruising a lot of the places, right? We talk about there was 29 documented falls causing bruises, skin tears, emergency room treatments, um, severe pain. Um, what happened after her emergency department visit, they sent her right back to the facility where falls continued to happen. Um, here in the deposition report, um, they were saying that she was found on the floor of the restroom. Um, a week later, she was again found on the floor of the restroom, sent to the hospital, was in a lot of pain. She came back, had another fall, uh, skin tear to her right knee and abrasions on her back. 
Um, down here is fall 25, again in the bathroom floor. Um, and then all the way down to fall 27, 6 15 in the morning on the bathroom floor, skin tears all around the arm and her elbow. Um, so as you can see, um, the falls continuously happen in this bathroom setting, yet there's nothing done about it at all. Um, and it says she's always falling down there, um, as you can see in here, they talk about uh, the documentation of the falls. It always happened around 6, 6.30 in the morning. So the question is, why didn't anyone check on her at 6.30 in the morning as she was using the bathroom? If we keep documenting um, that she's falling, why can't anyone take her to the bathroom there? Um, and they say the incident reports that there's tracking on every fall, um, and the facility nurse completed the unusual incident injury, uh, injury report, but yet nothing um, else was cited up for them. Uh, and they let all of this continue to happen. Um, and then right here, uh, in the court appointed attorney, um, in the deposition, they say that I've never seen any evidence that Carol Hahn is being neglected or abused. But if you go back and look at this slide with the bruises on her arm, how can you say that she was not abused? Um, and then we continue here, and they said the deputy stated that they checked on the welfare of Ms. Hahn several times, and each time they said they saw her in a safe uh, and well cared for state. But as we saw, a mattress on the floor, bruising on her arm, multiple falls, um, that's not the case. And again, we have here the penal code, code um, 368, um, where it says anyone that caused um, an elder or dependent adult to suffer unjustifiable pain or mental suffering is guilty of a misdemeanor, um, yet nothing was ever cited. It's escalated now to sexual abuse indicators. And the sexual abuse indicators in Carol Hahn's case she had unexpected genital infections. She had unexpected vaginal bleeding, body uh, bloody underclothing. Um, these are all social indicators of Carol Hunt's case. Um, she became extremely agitated. She withdrew from social interactions. Um, she had panic attacks such as PTSD and um, displayed unusual behavior. sexual abuse, she was terrified of the male caregivers who worked alone with her at night. Unexplained vaginal infections, un unexplained vaginal bleedings requiring ER treatment. Uh, Carol was sent to the ER facility uh, where uh, they, they uh, examined and there was increased vaginal bleeding and severe ag agitation. The facility evicted Carol. The facility lost staffing records. The facility terminated the male caregiver. The facility concealed evidence of any sexual abuse whatsoever. The male ca caregiver, he took the fifth on sexual assault. Sexual abuse court record. The facility tenant service notes. They spoke with the hospice nurse. She noted blood clot in vagina midways. Bleeding from vagina increased and hospice suggested we send her out non-emergency ambulance to the ER to be evaluated. Sexual, court, uh, sexual abuse court records. Again, the emergency room report. Patient began to scream loudly, stop touching me, stop. Stop. She began to kick and frail. Again, court records, hospital, hospice records. Day after her ER visit, uh, Maria hired a caregiver, estimated patient had about a cup of blood earlier. The doctor had orders to pack the vagina with gel foam, followed by rolled up abdominal pads. It's just horrifying. Emergency room medical doctor, this is the deposition testimony. His question, I'm unsure why an elderly woman such as Carol Hahn experienced vaginal bleeding. Answer, sexual assault, for example, causing trauma. 
could lead to vaginal bleeding. Question, is it possible that Carol Hong could have been subjected to sexual abuse or physical abuse and had gone undetected at the ER? And uh, the medical doctor answered, it is possible. Again, more deposition ter uh, testimony. The foul smelling discharge that you observed, could that have been the result of sexual intercourse or discharged semen? The medical doctor testified it could have been. Question, is it possible that sexual abuse could have caused some type of trauma presented with vaginal bleeding? Again, the medical doctor testified it is possible. So as Vivian had, had stated, it started out with falls and now it's escalated to sexual abuse by the caregivers. More testimony, question. So isn't it possible that perhaps Carol Hahn was a victim of sexual abuse and it just went undetected. The answer from the medical doctor, sure, it is possible. The male caregiver's deposition testimony. Question, did you ever sexually assault Carol Hahn? The facility attorney, I'm going to direct the witness to assert his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Question, is this my client, Linda Kincaid? This is my client, Linda Kincaid. Carol Hahn was her mother. Can, can you tell Linda Kincaid whether or not you ever sexually abused her mother? The facility attorney, I'm going to direct the witness to assert his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. You're not going to answer the question? The caregiver said no. Continuing deposition testimony. Do you know the cause of the vaginal bleeding? Answer, from the discharge paperwork, my nurse's notes said it was constipation. Unbelievable. Question, who did anyone ever tell you that vaginal bleeding was caused by constipation? Answer, my nurse noted to me about constipation and a possible blood clot that was what she spoke about. So here, it's just all deflection. It's a derailment from the truth and what's happening in these facilities. Sexual abuse court appointed attorney. This is a legal document from a lawsuit. Opposition to move. It does not appear that there is a valid medical reason relating to the care of Carol Hahn that would justify moving her to a different facility at this time. This poor woman was just extremely abused. The licensing. There is a complaint investigation report. The male staff no longer works for the facility. The LVN was not aware of concerns or problems with the male the male uh, staffer at the facility who provided care to resident one, who was Carol Hahn. Therefore, this allegation is found inconclusive. All right, let's continue on. County Council, and this is from the County of San Bernardino, letter from County Council. This is to advise the Sheriff's Department will not be responding to the daughter's inquiries any, any further. They're tired of the daughter. They said, you know, she has, 
she's just continuing making complaints and she's actually disturbing the sheriff's department at this point. Sexual abuse law enforcement, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. There is no evidence of a crime. San Bernardino County District Attorney. Again, there is no evidence of a crime. Penal Code 243.4. Any person who touches an intimate part of another person who is institutionalized for medical treatment and who is seriously, seriously disabled or medically incapacitated, and if the touching is for the purpose of sexual arousal, sexual gratification, or sexual abuse, is guilty of a sexual battery. Thank you, Julie. Um, another point about all these cases is when they ask the, um, the assisted living facility um, for the records of um, which caregiver uh, was in the room during those time periods, um, those records could not be found. Um, there was a missing part of the record of when uh, the caregiver was logging in and out um, for the specified time that uh, was in question. Um, so we now have another case of um, David Forbes versus Wildwood. So again, same same assisted living facility. Yes. Uh, so are you going to go into what happened to Carol Hahn? Um, so everything at the end was inconclusive. Uh, Carol Hahn has since been passed. Um, but yes, everything ended uh, inconclusive. Um, they still um, deny the daughter's rights to any of these records. Um, so we're just trying to, we're using uh, Carol Hahn as um, a statement of saying like, this is what happened, this is what happens to people that fall through their cracks, fall through the system, um, can be your grandmother, can be your grandfather. Um, so yeah, that's what we're trying to show here. What was the question, I'm sorry? Uh, the question was, uh, what happened to Carol Hahn? Um, so as you see here, um, again, it's Wildwood, the same assisted living facility. Um, and as we continue to dive into the court records and the citations and everything like that, um, it's important to note that um, all the allegations were towards the same male caregiver that took care of Carol Hahn. Um, so here's a little brief overview of his case injury. Um, there were non-injury falls, um, again, lots of falls, um, same as Carol Hahn. But there was an injury fall that resulted in a broken hip. Um, and then he returned to the facility with a urinary catheter. Um, the catheter was blocked for two days. Um, the abdomen was so swollen that it looked like he was nine months pregnant. Um, and then he died the following day from urosepsis. Um, so as you see here, this is, um, again, court records from the elder abuse lawsuit. Um, it said that based upon David William Forbes' inability to conduct his activities of daily, living, of daily living, the facility was prohibited from admitting David William Forbes as a resident as a matter of regulation. Um, so what it's trying to show here is that he should not have been in an assisted living facility, where essentially it's like when you, you send your student off of, to college, there's someone there that has meals for you, cleans up the room, but there's not a skilled nursing facility. So it's trying to show here that he shouldn't have been there. He should have been in a skilled nursing facility rather than an assisted facility. Based on regulations, David Forbes should never have been admitted. And this is the same for Carol Hahn earlier. Yet the facility um, admitted them anyways because again, we talk about it, it's, there's a big thing about um, as they bring in patients, they have more money, more um, financial resources. Um, David William Forbes suffered from two preventable uh, falls, and we see this um, parallels to the Carol Hahn case. At six in the morning every day, she continuously falls in the bathroom, but no one has ever assisted her um, there. Um, again, it said he was not suitable for admission, yet they admitted him as a resident in this facility. Um, and then on one, on the his third fall, he fractured his hip and was then transferred to the hospital where he underwent surgery to repair his broken hip. Again, um, they're sending them to an assisted living facility. He shouldn't have been there because he did not pass the test that, um, that was needed. Um, and we see here in the doctors, again, stating that he couldn't conduct any of his activities of daily living, so he should never have been admitted to an assisted living facility. 
that's just play that just play that just allows them to have a place to stay, someone to clean up for them, make them food, but they don't have the skilled nursing staff. Um, and he shows here David Ford would be bedridden for 180 days because there was no one there to take care of him. Um, and this continues, um, we're talking about um, after he underwent surgery and had the catheter, he shouldn't have been uh, admitted back into the facility. Um, as we can see here, we talked about it a little bit earlier, he looked like he was nine months pregnant. He was in severe pain and there was no urine draining from the catheter into the catheter bag. Um, and this was a condition that they noted the day prior as well. So we saw that no one is going in to check on him. If you have a catheter in, you should check whether or not there has been urine output um, into the bag, but there was nothing there. Um, and then at the hospital, they um, removed 1,800 cc's of urine from his bladder because all of this was being blocked back by this catheter that was not being properly taken care of. Um, and after that, the very next day, he died of urosepsis because of the lack of proper care he received because he was not admitted to the proper type of facility. Um, and even here, the regulation states that the staff um, who assist a resident must complete training provided by licensed professionals sufficient to meet the resident's needs. Um, and the training, um, they stated, of uh, taking care of the Foley catheter consisted of a memo and three pages printed from the internet from drugs.com. We can all look on drugs.com right now, and um, in this instance, they said that we can now take care of a Foley catheter. Um, I know I can't do that without the proper training, so it's hard to imagine how we can ask a caregiver um, to help there. And again, like in the Carol Hahn case, they were cited. Um, they were asked to submit a statement of um, that they will not do it again uh, regarding staff trainings, restricted conditions, and to improve upon this, but there was no penalty assessed, right? A big analogy I like to think of is you're speeding down um, on the freeway, right? On the 405, you're speeding down there, you get pulled over, you get a ticket, you get a fine. And what's that to say, hey, don't do this again, don't do this again, right? But in this case of someone dying, or in the case of Carol Hahn, a victim of a lot of physical abuse and sexual abuse, there's no penalty assessed. How can we say, stop doing it if we don't penalize you for um, all of these issues? Um, and again, they had several falls, um, they pulled on the catheter, they showed signs of discomfort, and all of these allegations were substantiated um, in all of the court memos um, as well. Um, again, as you continue to see, they're aware of the, assist, uh, the residents' needs, but again, no penalty assessed. Um, and then this is kind of hinting at what uh, Julie was talking about. Um, per the service plan for resident one, um, they required, uh, they have about 365 minutes per day, um, and on the AM shift, they require 180 minutes to take care of pa uh, the patient, David Forbes, right? Um, and for the AM shift, the assigned caregiver would be available for 430 minutes um, after subtracting breaks um, and lunch, um, and they would only have 400 minutes. Um, and this caregiver was taking care of nine patients. So that would approximately um, round out to be about 45 minutes per resident. But as we see um, on these pages here, for David Forbes, um, the caregiver, per the plan, needed to take care of them for 180 minutes. And for Carol Hahn, she needed 105 minutes of care just in the morning. Yet, they only have 435 minutes a day to take care of the patient. How, how is that possible? I'm not a mathematician, but that math does not add up. So what we're trying to say is they were assigned to nine other residents too. Just taking care of David Forbes and Carol Hahn according to the morning care plan, it would um, use up over half of their allocated time. Um, and they have seven other patients to visit. So it shows that there's just, there's, they don't have the ability to go in to check the catheter, to go in and take them to the bathroom to make sure they're not falling. Um, and we see again that Forbes and Han were assigned to the same caregiver. They both suffered from neglect, falls, and avoidable injuries. So it brings up these ideas of policy discussion and questions. Um, what can we do now? What can we do, right? Um, a big thing that Julie hinted at is 
we need more caregivers um, to take care of these patients. Obviously, they're being overworked. Um, they don't have the time to provide um, proper care to all of the patients. Um, why can't we introduce um, financial penalties? You get penalized for littering. You get penalized for speeding, for not doing a full stop at a stop sign. Yet you're not being penalized for mistreating um, our elderly population. Um, and there's no uh, uh, revocation of licenses. They talked about earlier the male caregiver no longer worked at the facility, but he does work at another facility oh. now. Um, and report neglect and abuse to law enforcement office. And I know um, we talked about there is a Senate Bill 1911, uh, which talks about moving um, this type of elder abuse under guardianship and conservatorship to make it criminal. Right, right now, it's just a civil matter, right. um, which prevents law enforcement from being able to uh, enter in and uh, actually help. Um, and then again, again, like we're saying, investigate abuse as a crime or for abuse to the district attorney to prosecutions. And um, the big question that you know we don't have figured out and we're all trying to figure it out is how can public health professions seek to help to continue to protect seniors as well as dependent adults? Um, and with this, I know we left this with a lot of looming questions about how we can proceed from there, but we'd like to open it up if anyone else had any questions. Yeah, so obviously we can't like say for sure, but um, if you watch the, the uh, documentary Guardians, um, we see that there's a lot of connections between um, the judge, the conservator, the fiduciary, um, as well as in some of the cases um, described in the movie The Guardians, as well as the real estate agents and the doctors as well. Um, because as we can see uh, with Carol Hahn's case, they. Um, they took in a $1 million estate of hers. So um, obviously there's findings and seeing those connections between um, these professionals. Yeah, so the process of um, getting a conservator, um, as we'll see, uh, we saw in the, the little clip of the trailer of the Guardians is, it can happen without them knowing. Uh, it can happen to one of our grandmothers without me, my grandmother without me ever knowing. Um, basically, they have a, um, they show in the documentary they have a report from the doctor or from the nurse saying that this person is incapacitated. They do not have the ability to make their own decisions. Um, they'll take them straight to the court, um, and then the court will say um, basically they'll say yes, they're incapacitated. They cannot make their own decisions about living, um, their sexual decisions as well as voting decisions and financial. Um, decisions and they'll revoke all of those civil rights from them and the court will just automatically appoint them to a conservator and sometimes it's a professional conservator um, there are times that um, it, it could be um, your um, what is it your family but a lot of the times it's a professional conservator